Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm honored to be your speaker tonight. Uh, it's the first time for me at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, first time for me actually in the state of Minnesota, so I'll check that box. Uh, and I do want to thank also the Veritas Forum for sponsoring this event and um, for the local planning committee for making this possible. And I hope tonight we're going to have a thoughtful discussion. Now, I've titled the talk, The Doctor's Gaze, Some Ancient Opinions on How We See Our Patients. And I'm going to start with a story. Um, and this is when I was a first-year resident over 30 years ago. Now, for some, that may be ancient history. But I want to put an asterisk here. I'm not one of the ancient voices, OK? I'm going to give you some other voices that are going to be the ancient voices. So I was a first-year resident in Boston on the internal medicine service. And we were on call one night. And the way that worked was we would go down to the emergency room, pick up our patient, uh, bring them up to the floor, sometimes literally bring them to the floor, take our history and physical, write our orders, and go back down and repeat the cycle. Get our patient, bring them up to the floor, do our history and physical, write our orders, go back down and get another patient. So most nights were busy. We would be up most of the night. There occasionally would be nights we would have a quiet night, and we might actually find a hospital bed, and we'd lie down and make sure the nurse didn't take any vital signs. But most of the nights were busy. And so this particular night, I had eight admissions, and so I was up uh, for most of the night. But usually around three or four, the admissions would stop, and that's when we would go back, and we would finish our notes. So I remember writing my physical on one of my patients, to completing the note at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'm writing the history, and I'm going down to the genital exam, and I write down... <clears throat> Testes descended, uncircumcised male, no masses, no lesions, no hernias. Continue to write down to the end of the physical, go to sign my note, and realize that I had done a very detailed male physical on my patient, Gertrude. <laughs> so I learned a lot of things in that first year in medicine, but I knew that one was going to be a challenge all my life to see my patients as specific and distinct persons as individuals who are in that hospital bed, but really they have a place in a world other than that hospital bed. They belong somewhere else. They're a part of something more, their, their family, their community. And it's in these places that they have specific roles to play. So thus began for me a long curiosity to understand how our view of the patient is formed. What are the forces and factors that create the doctor's gaze? Now, there are many. You can make your own list. There's the basic ones like our family upbringing and our temperament. There are some that are functioning in the most practical ways, the ones I've already alluded to, time and pressure. Those influence our view of the patient. They've always been there and they always will be there, and sometimes they're the most dominant because they're the most forceful. Some of them are those large and unmanageable conditions or circumstances like the economics of healthcare and healthcare policy and politics. But I think some of the most important ones are the ones that come to us through our culture. And I'm speaking about the immediate medical culture that we're all brought up in, but also the larger societal culture. And it's important for us to look at them because, first of all, they're influences we all share. And secondly, they're influences that often lie hidden below the surface. And because they're hidden, they can be the most powerful because they're based in tacit and assumptions that we rarely name. So one of my goals tonight is to name, try to name some of them, to bring them out in the open with the hope that by seeing them more clearly, it might allow us to see whether they fit, whether we like the proportions in which they fit so that they can form the kind of picture of the patient that we want to have. So one of the things I'm hoping to do tonight for you is to stop and look. Now, for the sake of creating our conversation tonight, I'm going to set out sort of the architecture of my plan. I'm going to offer you four perspectives. And I think, at least say at the outset, all of them are valuable, but their value is heavily dependent upon their proportionality, their balance in the mix. And I'm going to suggest that you imagine these four perspectives on two levels. So you can imagine two of the perspectives on the first level and two on the second level, almost like a two-story house. And I'm going to make the case that the first two, on the first level, they come more naturally as products of Western society. They fit more with the cultural forces of modernity and late modernity, and therefore they more easily exert their influence on us. While the other two views are more quiet, they're more tenuous, they, they, some, they might lie in undiscovered territory for some. 
But even if we have some familiarity with them, because they're more subtle and tenuous, they're easily overwhelmed by the power of the other views. So with that structure in mind, let me get right into the first perspective, what I've called the patient as vulnerable project. And I want you to look at this, um, this uh, comic strip with me. And you can see this very large man walking down the beach. And um, I'd probably say he has metabolic syndrome. It's my guess. And the, you can only, we can only see the back of him, and he has this tiny little Speedo on. And as the couple walks by, the husband says to the wife, you're right, health is a lot like Speedos. There's only so much it can cover. Now, I know I'm hijacking this comic strip from the healthcare debates we had not too long ago, but I think besides it being a commentary on a healthcare policy, I think it also reminds us of something innate about the human condition. That hope for health is a fragile pursuit, and deep down we know that despite our best efforts, we remain exposed. We come into this profession at some level knowing that we and our future patients are vulnerable persons. And as healthcare professionals, that view is naturally reinforced along the way by the unique window we have on life. We know that life can be tragic and health can be extremely fragile because of the inside track we have on injury, sickness, and death. We know of those who have waited two or three years to have a baby to get pregnant only to have a fetal demise. We, we've had ch a ch children who've had cancer or perhaps a family member who dies of premature heart disease or maybe a family is ripped apart by infidelity and a sexually transmitted disease are brought into the family. In one sense, it's a privileged position, but it's also a hard one because we're practicing medicine as a tragic profession. We are acquainted with grief because there's so much sadness. But it's also our good fortune that we live in the age of unprecedented scientific accomplishments. The scientific project of the last 100 plus years has given us enormous possibilities to fix what's broken. Now, one of the good outcomes of this perspective, I think, is that it should motivate us to learn our craft well become skilled in the practice of their profession to pursue excellence, because who we're helping, learning to help is vulnerable, sick people. Now, I admit it's not always easy to learn our craft well. There's so much to learn, and there's always more to learn. I remember when I was a student at Columbia in New York City, and I was in the midst of the basic sciences and studying some arcane equation or something that I couldn't see made any sense with anything. And I was very discouraged, and first, I just left the dorm, and somehow I found myself in the hospital, and I don't even remember how this happened, but I was sitting next to it down, I was talking to a patient from Harlem, a man my age who was very vulnerable to sickness because of his abnormal hemoglobin. He had been admitted for sickle cell crisis. And so I spent better that part of an hour talking to him and learning about what we had in common and many things that we didn't have in common and how he dealt with life with his disease. And I, I can tell you for sure that when I went back to the dormitory, I was much more motivated to learn about the hemoglobin molecule and hemoglobinopathies and how we could help them because I knew about him. I think that as we remember why we are learning and who it is we are helping by our learning, it should motivate us to know the quality science that undergirds diagnosis and treatment because it's our job to bring the best of, better medical, better, best of biomedical science to each of our patients. Now, as we know, one of the necessities, if we are to look well through this lens, is some stepping back to develop what I would, I've called the clinical gaze, or whether, it's, not, it's not my term, but the clinical gaze. Basically, it's that where we learn to look at our patient as a set of working parts, we know how the parts of the body work, how they malfunction, and what we can do to repair that malfunction. Now, part of the debt for that clinical gaze that's so valuable for us today, we owe to the period of the Renaissance. So that period is roughly between 13 and 1600, because that's when the paradigm shift occurred from a medieval approach to the importance of basing our medicine in knowledge and observation. Now, one of the first publications that documented that change was the printing of the Fasciculus Medicinae in 1491. It was the first illustrated medical book a book of only 29 pages. It would have been what da Vinci would have used uh, when he was uh, as a dissection manual and his primary source of medical knowledge. Six of the pages were occupied by illustrations, of which this is one. And as you look at the illustration, you can see at once that at one level there's the barber surgeon, and he's dissecting the body, and there's a demonstrator that's pointing out the structures, and there's a heavily disinterested audience observing on that floor. But what I want you to notice is the, the professor sitting 
up on the higher level in his magisterial throne, intoning the Latin text, the text of scholars, not the text of the common people, never descending down to actually look at the patient, but maintaining distance to teach objectively what, he ha what, they, what must be learned. Now, as we've diligently pursued our knowledge of the body over the years since that time, the temptation to stand at a distance has only increased, especially as we depend more and more on our technology to see our patients. Now, this is not to demean or deny the value of technology. Every image created can become a helpful way to gain the objective view, each one augmenting our senses beyond their natural abilities. But as we increasingly depend on more and more powerful forms of technology through which we view the patient, it makes it increasingly difficult to return to the patient and get it all to make sense for them. So maybe we've seen the bulging disc on the MRI or the torn meniscus on the uh, MRI, but does it, make any, does it have anything to do with the patient's concerns? It requires us to have conscious vigilance to remind ourselves that every technologically created image is an abstraction of the true patient and by its power has the capacity to take us farther and farther away from them. Now what happens if we move back away from the patients in order to gain the objective view and end up staying back? Standing apart from the patient, we're at risk of harboring two very unhelpful attitudes. The first one is about ourselves, that we, possess, that we possess the power to fix all of our patients' problems. And we all know that that's an attitude that far too easily becomes grandiose and delusional. And the second one is in relation to the patient, that we look at the patient paternalistically. And though that may be a benevolent attitude, it nevertheless is a controlling and superior one. And that brings us to the second perspective, the patient as autonomous being. Now, that's a more recent development and it's needed at least in part because of a response to the overindulgence of the first view. But even though it may be a reaction to the paternalism of that first view, it's very much in accord with the cultural view that has become the dominant understanding of self in our society. What we might call, or what I'm going to call, the Promethean view. Many of you have been to the Rockefeller Center in New York City. Uh, we used to go there at, Chris, at Christmas time and watch the skaters. And if you go there, you see Prometheus lying on his side with a clump of fire in his hand. And as you may remember the story, Prometheus was a titan god who deceived Zeus and stole fire from him and gave it and all sorts of other divine gifts and knowledge to mortals. Now in a good sense, that's the Greek mythological explanation for how we came to have art and literacy and culture and all the technical developments of our society. But there's also the underside of technology because it also made us believe that we have the power to control our own destiny, that we are not dependent but independent creatures. And to use uh, Charles Taylor, philosopher Charles Taylor's terms of self-authorization, we can order our world and flourish on our own terms, each of us our own master with, a, with freedom of choice, the prime value, meaning that we can have it the way we want it. Now, the good side of this perspective, the patient is autonomous being, is that we learn to respect each one's autonomy in their particular situation. This is a needed corrective. Here we are patient-centered, we believe that each individuals have the right to understand what's happening to them, and, we, and then we also invite them to participate in the medical decisions that will affect their lives. But when this perspective is excessively exercised, it turns the medical covenant into a contract. It creates a loss of trust in the doctor-patient relationship or the practitioner-patient relationship and the ordering of the healthcare along a have-it-your-way menu-oriented approach with expected outcomes and angry customers when the result is not obtained. Now, in my own experience, nowadays far more than ever, patients come to me and tell me what they want. It might come from the television, it might come from the internet, it might come from what someone else got when they went to their doctor. But the worst part of all this is not that they ask this of me, the worst part is that they expect that I can give it. And so changing that interaction into a demand and expectation transaction gravely distorts the image. Now what I've already suggested is that these first two views, the patient as autonomous being, the second view, and the patient as vulnerable project, the first view, are heavily dependent on our modern and late modern mindset. And therefore, they're more natural for us to assume because they mimic that mindset. So at this point, what I want to do is call in one of my ancient voices in order to consolidate these, these uh, first two perspectives. And I can think of no better person to call in as a consult 
than that surprising specialist of modern culture. Some of you may recognize him, but this is Frederick Nietzsche. Now, in many ways, there's no greater prophet of our current culture than Nietzsche. Though writing over 150 years ago, he understood with unusual prescience what would be some of the most powerful influences in our world today. Some of you may know him well. He was uneventfully born in a small uh, rural Herb, uh, German parsonage in 1844, but he became, became one of the most brilliant, he really became the most brilliant philosopher of his time. He was precocious, he was prolific, he was a genius to the point of becoming megalomaniacal in his last years. But whatever your view of his overall philosophy, when you read Nietzsche, one of the things you can't help but admire is his intellectual honesty. And that honesty led him, over the course of the development of his philosophy, to accept his mistakes, mistakes and make significant changes uh, over the course of his career. Yet there were several elements of his philosophy that were there from the beginning and only strengthened with time, two of which I think apply specifically to our discussion tonight. The first one was his awareness that life is tragic and suffering is an intransient component of reality. In fact, that became one of the major critiques of, of the philosophy of his time that it denied the reality of suffering in the world. And he claimed that modern, modernity's optimism is a superficial whitewash in its attempts to paint out the picture of suffering. So his first important work was called The Birth of Tragedy. And uh, in that, he argued that it was the Greek tragedies of old that best defined life correctly. That life is a struggle, and that what we need is to be heroic if we're going to survive and overcome. The second element that he had from the beginning became very strong as his philosophy develops is what he called the pathos of distance. That in order to live in a world of suffering, one had to maintain distance. So suffering, or the German word leid, was very real, but mitleid, which is suffering with, or translated as pity, was a destructive emotion. It's something that makes us weak and ineffective. Mitleid would paralyze the helpful hand. Empathy would destroy us, he said. We'd be so overwhelmed to think of all the pain in Africa that it would, as he said in quotes, unhinge, unhinge the wings of the soul. It's something he repeated over and over in his mature works. And in fact, he ultimately incarnated in his own life as he became more and more separate from others and increasingly isolated and lonely as he aged. But he felt that was the cost he had to pay as the herald of a new age. Now, for those of you who know Nietzsche, in the end, Nietzsche's conclusion was power, that that would define and direct the new age. Whereas he summarized it in his final years, there is the will to power and nothing else. The goal was to seek mastery, first over self, and for those who had the power to overcome self, they would be the super race of the new age, or what he called Superman, who would then exert their power for the good of culture and society. Now, I don't know if I've been clear to this point, but what I'm suggesting that it is inherent in our perspective of the patient thus far, the two views that I've given you, is this mindset of control. That that's one of the com commonalities that links them. So if we go from the first perspective where increasingly the doctor is in control, that gives way to the second perspective, the patient is in control. But either way, whether the doctor or the patient is in control, we forget what we one time understood that we're inherently vulnerable that our existence is fragile, finite, and fleeting, and in fact, neither of us are in control. Now, at this point, I could give many illustrations of how easy it is to forget the inherent vulnerability of our existence. But what I'm asking you to consider is that the cultural forces of control and self-authorization make it exceedingly difficult to remember this basic truth about ourselves. Again, I'll say it again. What I'm asking you to consider is that the cultural forces of control and self-authorization make it exceedingly difficult to remember this basic truth about ourselves. Now, in our context, remembering has a twofold value for our current task. Because first of all, it makes us aware that the first level, the, the two perspectives that I've given you thus far on the first level, they can be good in their proper measure. But it also shows that they're insufficient for our noble task and thus it prompts us to want to look further in our perspective of the patient. So using my analogy of the two-level house, it invites us to explore what's on the second floor. Now I might argue that in some sense, 
we don't know how to get to the second floor. It's almost like the, we're on the first floor and we don't know where the stairs are. Or maybe we know where the stairs are, but they're creaking and they're old and we're afraid they're going to crack if we go up. But I think for sake of enrich, enriching our understanding of the patient, let's take the risk and go up to the second floor. Now, as we go up and enter on the first room of the second floor, I'm going to give you our third image. The patient is sacred traveler. And uh, for that, I'm going to have you uh, illustrate that with this old fresco. This is a fresco that uh, was, uh, is from around 1440. And it, uh, it depicts a scene on the Pilgrim's Hall on the ground floor of the Hospital of Santa Maria della Scala in Siena, across from the Siena Cathedral. It's one of Europe's first hospitals, was, was actually one of the largest and most famous in medieval Italy. And this um, fresco still hangs there in that Pilgrim's Hall. And it functioned at that time primarily as a shelter and as an infirmary for the countless pilgrims who came through Siena. The interesting thing is there were a lot of pilgrims that came through Siena because on the road to Rome. So in the scene, we see the doctor kneeling before the patient, surrounded by some consulting physicians. And the physician that's kneeling is looking at the face of the patient, and he's wiping the foot with a towel. I think you could perhaps remember this particular uh, position compared to the fasciculus medicinae if you wanted to make a comparison. But notice the focused look of the physician as he gazes at the patient and, and try to imagine what he's seeing. Consider what a sensate experience it is. It's he's seeing, he's touching, and he's probably also smelling if you look at the wound on the, on the right uh, thigh there. So he's having a very concrete experience with the patient. But also, in the way he's looking at him so intently, there's something holy about his attitude as well as he gives this care in this church-based infirmary. Because he's looking at the person as someone special, someone with a God-given dignity, because they're made in the image of God, and in that sacred view, also a person that has a destiny. It's very easy for this physician to know this person's on a journey. After all, they're a pilgrim on the way to Rome. But the person is also recognizing the patient as being on a spiritual pilgrimage, that he's come from God, that he's on a journey, and that it's a journey home back to the God who created him for a purpose. Now, if you think about that kind of view, it has great value for us, because when we look at a person this way, it gives us great resolve to defend patient dignity beyond any prejudice of society, irrespective of gender, race, or national origin, and regardless of any physical or mental ability. But it actually goes beyond any human value of judgment, even our own sense of for the value of the person. Because it, and it even supersedes our own limited view of ourselves. Because none of us fully grasp how much worth we have in the eyes of God or how much purpose God has created us to have in the life he's given us. Now in the second room on this second floor, I have my last image for you. And it's the patient as fellow pilgrim. And for that, I'm going to illustrate it with this painting from the early 1800s. And the painting is called The Pilgrimage, Pilgrimage to Canterbury. And many of you would be familiar with the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. He wrote it in the, uh, it's really his greatest work, and he wrote it in the late uh, 14th century. And if you remember the story, there's a host who's the innkeeper, there's Chaucer, and there's 29 pilgrims. 39 pilgrims at all, and in fact, if you went in there and counted them, they're all there. Now, if you remember the story, what, the, what the, the plan was, was that each pilgrim would tell a tale on the way to Canterbury, and each pilgrim would tell a tale on the way back, and whoever told the best tale would get a free din at the, dinner at the inn. It turns out that Chaucer died before he could finish all the tales. But in the tales that he did tell, he provides a very interesting picture of humanity that seems less available to us now than then, but I think it might be essential to recover. Because if you look carefully at the pilgrims, they're a motley crew representing all the divisions of society at that time. There's a working class miller, there's a mercantile merchant, there's a noble knight of military prowess, there's an intellectual prioress, there's a socialist and a conservative, there's a corrupt church officials and a carpenter and a cook. They're all on the journey together. And what Chaucer shows is that despite the wide differences in the stations of life represented by each pilgrim, any, which, when, any one of which are capable of destroying the fellowship, they stay together and share the journey because they're all going to the same place. 
they're all going to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket in Canterbury Cathedral to thank him for his help throughout the year, especially for the times when they were sick. So it's because of the definite and common goal of the journey, that's what's crucial for keeping the pilgrims on the same pilgrimage and turning a crowd of incongruous people into one company. Now that image of humanity, I would suggest is an enticing one because it offers us the idea that what we have in common is more important than what makes us different. Now, if we quickly bring that idea forward to our own world as healthcare workers, we can immediately see that one of the things that we have in common and we share with our patients is our common vulnerability to sickness, suffering, and death. Now, admittedly, there are times when that perspective is more easy to entertain than others. For example, when you meet a patient who's your age and has a condition that you could have. Uh, a recent patient of mine was my age and they were, had colon cancer. It made me wonder about my own risk of colon cancer. Perhaps it's a patient that is having a miscarriage and you had one or your wife had one or someone close to you had one. Perhaps you're treating a patient with lupus and your sister has lupus. It's at these times that we entertain more this perspective of commonality. There are other times that, that um, it's more like we're forced to consider this perspective. Like when we face a global epidemic, when we face contagious diseases like Ebola or some other global infectious disease, that challenges some of our most basic assumptions about separation and safety. How do we react in those situations? Do we recognize our shared vulnerability and act accordingly, or do we try to increase the separation? In the Ebola outbreak that I talk about in the book, both of those were at work. What I want to say about this attitude is it's more than just a but for the grace of God go I kind of perspective. That has a separation kind of concept to it. It's more, but it's more by the grace of God we go together. With this view, we're invited to consider that we're only as healthy as our neighbor. That isolated health, that isolated individual cannot be healthy, or to use Wendell Berry's term, the community, a place in all its creatures, is the smallest unit of health. Many of us have little trouble recognizing that isolation and loneliness is one of the greatest risks to our patient's health. The question is, do we recognize that isolation and loneliness is one of the greatest risks to our own health? Now, let's not be naive. The, the second floor is not an easy place to get to. For, for some, we don't, even, we don't even know it's there. But there's a, a whole array of forces lined up against it. Most of the most obvious are the personal ones. I mean, let's be honest. There's a basic natural human hesitation to get close to difficult things. Life in the trenches is messy. We prefer the clean, partitioned, and separate spaces of our techno-scientific understanding of the world. But there's all kind of cultural forces also that keep us on the first floor. The medical ones that tell us to maintain the professional patient distance, reminding us we are different. But there's also the larger cultural ideas that we are not creatures of destiny. Or we're certainly not creatures that share a destiny, if there is one. And anyway, there's this deep chasm of a secular sector divide, secular sector divide that we must not cross. But the honest truth is that it's neither safe or healthy for us or our patients to remain apart. And fortunately, in my experience, it's sometimes the patients that take down the wall. I had recently, this would be, say, six months ago, I had a patient who... Uh, I met in the homeless clinic where I work, and shortly into the history, he basically blurts out that he's tried to commit suicide six times. And when he said that, and then there was a pause, uh, first of all, I was shocked and somewhat overwhelmed by that thought, and then I was not able to find words to step into that space. And then fortunately, he, he stepped into the space and he said, you know, every time I've tried, something's happened that's thwarted me. God must have a reason why I'm still here. And in that statement, he invited me into a space that typically the secular sector divide keeps him away from, and yet I can see that the patients maybe want it as much or more than we do. Now, I've left the hardest task for the end. It still remains. How do we integrate all this? So for that, I'm going to bring in my cleanup hitter, uh, my last ancient voice. And this is an ancient voice that I call up because I think he has the ability to knit all these perspectives together into one view. And it's the, um, 
Italian poet of the late 13th and 14th century, Dante Alighieri. The reason why I think he has so much to offer is because of his brilliance as a poet, but also because he was uniquely placed on the cusp of the Renaissance as it dawned. So he was able to, to, to look back and look forward. He was able to look back and see the good of what had been, but he also had the ability to look forward and was excited about what was coming. So, so Dante was one of those people who, true to the Renaissance spirit, had a high opinion of reason and its ability to understand the world. He was excited about the knowledge being gained through the early scientific investigations of his time. Uh, and he basically was believing that the world would be a better place through scientific investigation. He also likewise, likewise understood the importance of personal choice and the need of the individual to exercise their freedom. Yet for Dante, the value of science and the importance of individual autonomy made sense to him only within the framework of a sacred view of humanity. So he said, man, big M man, had freedom. And that's one of the most important things about us, is what distinguishes us from other creatures. And he also knew that it would only make sense if man was seen as a part of the bigger story. And so he writes one of the biggest stories in all of Western literature, the epic adventure called The Divine Comedy. If you've never read it, someday I think you should. Uh, but in it, he takes us on a metaphorical journey through the afterlife. And when he does that, he does some very important things to help us understand life as a journey. Perhaps the most stunning is that he puts himself in the middle of the action. So listen to how he begins this, this, uh, this monumental work. He says, midway along the journey of our life, I woke to find myself in a dark wood, for I had wandered off the straight path. So from the very first lines of this massive and monumental poem of over 14,000 lines and 100 cantos, Dante the poet shows us that he's writing about Dante the pilgrim. And Dante the pilgrim is set out on a journey He's a man with a destiny, but he's lost his way. The other th then also what he makes clear as you read it is that he makes it clear that he must make the journey himself. No one can make it for him. He has to exercise his autonomy. He has to exercise his freedom. He has to make his own choices. But he's also someone who needs a lot of help to find his way. And so throughout his journey, he's aided by the help of others. The most important are his guides, Virgil, the writer of the Aeneid, and later Beatrice. But all on the way, he meets and talks to countless others, some teaching by their negative example, some teaching by their positive example. And when he ascends the Mount of Purgatory, the terraces are filled with fellow pilgrims, each struggling with different problems, but all believing they're on the way. And as they go, they know they both need help and need to give help to others if they're to make it. Now, if any of you take this journey with Dante, you'll have a thrilling adventure as you follow him down into the depths of hell and up into the heights of heaven. And everywhere you go, you're going to see the consequences of choice. But underlying all the individual stories and all the very specific places that people end up because of their choices, Dante throughout is posing that the most crucial decision you must make, the most basic choice of all, is how you see the world. Is the world ordered by love is, or is the world ordered by power? And he says you have to decide that. Now, I've tried to argue in our discussion this evening that if we stay on the first level of our house, we're in great danger of defining the world by power. We believe we can control circumstances. We seek mastery. We look at health as a possession that we can manage and manipulate because we live in a world ordered by us and for our own self. Each one autonomously pursuing and exerting their own power as individuals, and if Nietzsche would have his way, exerting their power over others. But on the second level, we recognize mystery and uncertainty. We seek relationship, and we look at health as a gift. We receive and nurture for our own sake, but also for the sake of others. Because we live in a world ordered by love, and love seeks not just that I arrive or you arrive, but that we all arrive. Now let me conclude with one last picture uh, to help you imagine maybe where you belong in all this. And the picture I'm showing you is, it's called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. And this is a Rembrandt painting from 1633. And it used to hang in the Gardner Museum in Boston until it was stolen with 12 other works in 1990. This is the only seascape that Rembrandt ever painted. 
And in it, he depicts a familiar scene for those of you who know the Bible. It's the scene from the life of Jesus. You can find it in Mark chapter 4. It's also in um, uh, other two Gospels, Matthew 8 and Luke 8. But in, packed into four or five verses is this dramatic scene of a furious storm, crashing waves, terrified disciples afraid they're going to drown, and this curious element of Jesus asleep in the stern and needing to be awoken so he can save them. Now, in recording the event in this painting, Rembrandt does a very interesting thing. Many of you know that there should be 13 people on the boat. There should be Jesus and his 12 apostles. But if you look very, very closely, you'll see there's 14 people. Because Rembrandt did here what he did in many of his paintings, he put himself in the painting. And by putting himself in the painting, what he's saying is, if you truly want to understand the story, you need to put yourself in it. You need to get in the boat and not stand apart at a distance. Now, last, our last slide, if you go to the Gardner Museum today, you're going to be surprised to find an empty frame hanging on the wall where once held by the storm on the Sea of Galilee, hanging there in homage to the missing work and representing hope that it will one day be returned. But I'd like to use it as an invitation for you to fill in the frame for yourselves. Don't let anyone rob you of the opportunity to paint your own picture of how you see your patients. Don't let it be limited by the fixed images of our culture, but make it a picture that incorporates all the perspectives of the patient and be sure to put yourself in the picture. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Cotillo, for um, that very good view of how we can see our patients through different uh, realms and how that impacts both how we treat them and also how we live. Um, this will open up the, the question uh, portion of this for approximately the next 30 to 45 minutes. If anyone has questions, if you just raise your hand, we'll be happy to come around. If you could just state your name and also the question that you have, uh, we'll have Dr. Cotillo answer them. Hi, my name's Ruth. Um, we hear a lot about burnout these days, and that's a sort of popular topic. I wonder if one of these perspectives, uh, if overemphasized, could be more or less associated with burnout, and I just wonder what your um, initial thoughts might be. Right. Well, that's probably a question that the audience would be happy to contribute to as well as they've tried to deal with burnout. Uh, I think that, um, again, returning to my own personal experience, um, I want to say that the second level of relationship with patients that I've painted is not something that you can achieve with every patient. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that you think of this more not as the law, uh, I'm not talking about a, a new law, but a spirit. It's more an attitude that you bring to your patients that, that there might be some patients that you will have this kind of relationship with. If you don't have a relationship with any of your patients that way, it's much more likely you're going to suffer burnout because you're basically staying in those perspectives in which the image is gravely distorted by the contract kind of relationship where you're basically just someone who's supposed to give what the patient expects. And sometimes you'll be able to do that and sometimes you won't. And when you don't, how do you live with that? And um, certainly if you think that you are in that first patient perspective, you actually do delude yourself into thinking you have the power to fix all your problems, all the patient's problems, that's gonna be a big cliff to fall off of. And um, living up there, you can probably delude yourself for a while up there, but if, the longer you stay up there, the bigger the fall. And um, so the sooner you realize that you can't do that, the better. Uh, I think burnout is, is, is at risk for some of the other array of forces that are surrounding our practice of medicine. Uh, if we're spending 80% of our time documenting our care and only 20% of the time of the patient, uh, that can't help our relationship building, can it? Uh, I hope that maybe over the course of time, both patients and the practitioners, because when you, put, when you go on physician satisfaction surveys, you see that one of the highest points of satisfaction is time with patients. If you do patient satisfaction surveys, you find one of the highest points of satisfaction is time with their doctor. 
So both patients and physicians and practitioners want more time with patients. Um, the system right now is, 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 is shrinking that, and that's going to increase burnout, I think. I don't know if that answers your question, or maybe you wanted to bring up a different point. While we're waiting for some uh, additional comments and questions, uh, in, in reading your book, which I would encourage uh, all the people in the audience to do if you haven't done so already, you're going to break down some of those similar um, kind of gazes into clinical gaze, statistical gaze, and gospel gaze, and how the clinical gaze often fractionates people into specific organ systems and focuses just on those and those alone and loses the care of the patient, whereas the statistical gaze looks at people in aggregate and loses that individuality of the patient in front of you. But yet the, the gospel gaze allows you to kind of walk alongside them and, and be next to them and have a bias towards love. Do you feel like since the, the climate of um, the current healthcare system is very heavily focused into specialties and subspecialties that we can come back to getting outside of that clinical gaze or allow the gospel gaze to permeate subspecialists to still be able to see the patient above and beyond just the organ system that they're trained to treat? Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that it's really just a specialist versus generalist problem. Um, I think it's uh, maybe one would say, you know, if you're a family physician like myself or a general internalist, internist, you are more taught to <laughs> see the patient as a whole, while if you're only uh, arguing uh, for the health of one organ system. But I think that the greater culture influences all of us beyond what specialty we're trained in. And I didn't... Um, uh, address the statistical gaze. I'm glad you brought that up because the statistical gaze uh, is a more recent development. Um, and we know that evidence-based medicine is a good thing. But when we let the statistical gaze over-influence, and again, you can see that in one of the themes of my conversation is something becomes good or bad more in the proportionality in which it's being used rather than that in and of itself it's purely good or purely bad. So this is not to say that understanding statistical awareness of our patients is a bad thing, but my problem would be, and I don't know if uh, you're explaining this in your specialty, but these days before I go in to see the patient, before I even cast my eyes on them, I already have like 10 things I'm supposed to do for them based on their age and based on their sex and based on the risk factors because the statistics, you know, tell me what they're at risk for. So I've got an agenda before I go in to see the patient. What happens when my agenda is not what the patient's agenda is? <laughs> There's a clash in, in, in that negotiation process. But if my agenda is too big when I go in there, I'll never hear the patient's agenda. So I feel that we need a corrective. I feel that the corrective comes from a more innate sense of humanity that comes both through our philosophical perspectives of life, our poetic perspectives on life, or as I said in the book, The Gaze of the Gospel, that if you understand uh, an incarnational view of, of life that, that Jesus Christ offers us, that physician who's kneeling and looking at that person in that way comes because of that understanding of that person. And that comes through a incarnational view that they are holistically valuable and they have a purpose in life. And it's hard sometimes, we talked about this at dinner before I came, it's hard sometimes to, you know, point out to the patient some of their false thinking, but then how do you actually get down a level of conversation to talk about meaning and purpose? That they are, that they, that it's not just whether or not their blood pressure is this or their cholesterol is that, but part of their health depends upon whether they have any meaning and purpose in life. And each of you have to come up with a way to to sort of try to bring this into the conversation, and many of the times it won't happen, but at least in where I work, where the, my homeless patients, they often come into me really feeling bad about what they just did, you know, whether it's uh, a sexual misfortune act, act, activity or a drug use. And, you know, you always want to give them hope to go forward. And, you know, one of the lines I always say, because I'm thinking about them, as a, as a whole journey is, you know, how you end is more important than how you begin. And, you know, you still have another chapter to write. And the, those, those ideas filter into my thinking because I'm thinking about this person not just today and what they did or what they didn't do, but what's next. And somehow we have to believe that people have a destiny 
in life if we're going to help them to think bigger than just the things we sometimes think about. And I think the gaze of the gospel is what I was trying to address in that chapter, yeah. I'm real concerned about the way the Mayo Clinic used to be. Uh, I'm a patient since 1958, and it was, it's been a wonderful journey. I'm 93, and I'm doing well. But the point is, uh, I had the most wonderful doctor, David Hoffman. Some of you may have heard of him. He was also my tennis partner and next door neighbor. But the point was that he always wanted to know the patient. And he was a tremendous internist. Everyone would like to have David Hoffman. But he complained to me, Willard, he says, I have to see so many patients a day. I'm on kind of a factory thing, which didn't used to be that way in the old days of the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I, I can understand because I was with him so much. And he loved people so much. And now it is a little bit uh, you're supposed to see so many patients a day or whatever. He felt that way anyway. And maybe he wanted to spend half an hour with a patient and maybe five minutes with another. Mm. He would judge how he would use his time. Mm -hmm. And I th think maybe we've lost some of that at the Mayo Clinic. Mm. And, you know, I've been here a long time. I'm in the study for aging for many years. And I want to express myself that I've seen the so-called old Mayo Clinic, and it's so wonderful. I'm part of the study for aging, whatever. It is such a great clinic, but I felt that sometimes the doctor is prescient. You just can't spend the time you'd like to spend with this patient. He, you may think he needs it or she needs it. That's my expression. Yeah. Well, one of the good things is learn to play tennis with your patients because <laughs> that'll build a relationship. I think part of what you alluded to is the wisdom of an experienced physician to um, negotiate sometimes uh, differing amounts of time. And in a sense, you're stealing time from one to give to the other. Um, but part of it is understanding the timing of the patient's needs at that point. I think that one of the things we're going to have to learn to do is see our patients perhaps as layers of an onion where we can't possibly deal with every issue on every visit. And so part of it is to understand what layer of the onion needs to be worked with and peeled back on this particular visit. And um, at least for some of the patients I see who have overwhelming numbers of needs, I have a little more time in my clinic than some of the more uh, factory-oriented clinics that you're experience talking about because we know that our pa at the clinic I work, we know that our patients have multidimensional problems. But for me, if I'm not going to get overwhelmed, I sometimes try to think, what is the layer of the onion to work with today? Uh, and somehow, avoiding burnout, feel like maybe some progress has been made on that issue today, because I can't possibly fix all these problems today. I'm curious about your time in the DRC and whether um, working in a cross-cultural setting in a role where you do have a sort of agenda outside of just being a physician, how that kind of may complicate or add to or change the gazes that you've talked about tonight? I think that you know one of the things that I would say is valuable for um, cross-cultural medicine is uh, being very um, direct about leaving your, taking some of your agendas out of your mind. <laughs> uh, so that I think one of the earliest things that I was doing was uh, trying to um, not have too many agendas and find out what the patient's agendas were or actually what the community's agendas were because we were doing more community-oriented healthcare rather than just individual patient healthcare. But if, if you weren't going to understand um, the situation of the patient in that context, which you didn't know, then you weren't going to help anyone. Uh, a good friend of mine has recently written a book, and he said the title of his book is called Global Health is Listening. And he's basically saying before you can go in with any agenda, you need to go in as a, with a listening ear. So I think that um, in the circumstances I was in uh, where um, there was a lot of violence 
the physical violence, militia violence, gender violence going on in that country, and uh, much of under-resources going on. Um, you look for things that, um, again, are what is the layer you can work with and what does the community want to work on, not just what you, what you want to work on. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Lindsay. I'm a second year medical student um, and haven't had many opportunities yet to interact with patients. Um, and I'm curious if you have any uh, postures or practices that you've adopted that have helped you to kind of keep your gaze on that second story. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an evolving thing, meaning that I don't think I already have it all figured out. And um, I think that a couple things that I have found helpful for me personally and this sounds really simple, but that uh, sacred traveler image I showed you with the physician kneeling and looking, I have found great help for me when I go into the room, if I can somehow, I know I have like six things I need to be thinking about, but if I can just stop for a second and look in their eyes, I mean, I mean just look in their eyes, it just makes a big difference because I see them you can't look in someone's eyes and not see their individuality. I think that's part of what I'm saying. Is you, I mean, you can look at their leg or you can, you know, your, your, your head wanders to, you know, when you listen to their chest. But when you look in their eyes, it just forces you to see them more as an individual. And then sometimes that leads me to just come up with... The other thing that I found is when I do is say something where you have a little something funny or something that relaxes the moment because they're a little tense and anything you can say to recognize that just something common about their humanity, the weather, the sports, anything that creates a commonality between you and them so you're on the same plane, and then that also eases the tension and sometimes takes away the strain of an otherwise forced relationship that's about to get hostile because they want something from you that you can't give them, which is not unusual. But if they know that you're on their side, that you see them as a person, and that you know maybe you know you have a something that they have in common, a son or a daughter, and you say something about that, that that's helpful. It, I also should say that, um, you know, they, they've done these studies. I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience know this better than I do. How fast it, does a patient, doctor inter interrupt a patient when they go into the room? And sometimes it's seconds when they do studies. You know, like the patient doesn't even speak for a minute. So one of the things you also should do is, it's not that hard to wait two minutes. Like, let someone say, get... They can say a lot in two minutes, and if you don't break in, you've already uh, started something the right way. I find it pretty hard to get beyond the second, the first floor. Yes. <laughs> and Thank I you wanted for your to. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I struggle the most with handling expectations. How do you? handle patient expectations with they want something you cannot give them. Right. Well, one, one smart piece of advice I once got was never assume before you go in that the expectation they have is outrageous. <laughs> in other words, like I used to would, someone would say, like in where I am, it's signing these disability forms. And so whenever that came up, I'd immediately say, this is a ridiculous request. Like I'm already preparing myself to have a, have a thing. And so someone wisely once told me, start with the assumption that what they're asking you is not outrageous. Like that from their point of view, it, it doesn't, it makes sense. And then you go in there and you come at it from that perspective. And then it helps you to see whether maybe it is more possible. Now that doesn't get rid of the expectations that are impossible to meet. And I think that that's something that um, we can do something about as individual physicians, but I think also we need to be speaking to our larger culture and our larger society about what is it that medicine has to offer. Because sometimes I think we're at fault that medicine makes promises it cannot keep. Why do we do that? Sometimes it's a societal perspective. Society expects medicine to bandage all of its wounds. We can't do that. So there's unrealis unrealistic attitudes on both sides. It, that's a societal uh, conversation that we should be having more and more. I think that we should be discussing things around aging and death in a more fa uh, faithful and uh, honest way and not think that we can cure death, as an example, or 
cure heart disease or cure cancer or cure poverty or any of these things that we think, you know, if we win the war, we'll solve that problem. These are unrealistic expectations that come from medicine, but they also come from the larger society of our modern mindset, the one that has a utopian perspective on life. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Um, I had a question about when you connect with patients emotionally and you're more, I guess, available and vulnerable, um, how do you avoid having that burnout because you're constantly dealing with the negative emotions or death, um, the right. sickness, and so I think part of, uh, I, I guess, the, what I see in the second floor is you're suffering with your patients sometimes along the way, and so how do you do that while still living your life and maintaining a healthy outlook, right. I guess? <laughs> Okay, so that's a really good question because that tells me you really get what I'm saying. That this is this is a the second level has a lot of challenges to it. Um, and in one sense, as um, if you've never read uh, Paul Kanafi's book, uh, "When Air Becomes Breath," when breath becomes air, it's the other way around. He was a neurosurgeon who died at age 40, but he said that medicine is a um, it's a holy calling and it's also wholly impossible. That to that when you try to bear someone's burdens, you can get under a cross and it can crush you. Now, when I hear that, I say, yes, but then that reminds me of what it means to have a sober understanding of this perspective of bearing someone else's burdens. I think that, well, first of all, I, I was trying to say that this is not a law, but a spirit. So how you look at the patients, how close you can get with some of the patients, this is not across the board. You're not gonna be sitting down and crying with every patient that comes into the room. It's going to be a selective involvement in different people's lives. But part of it is knowing that you are not supposed to bear their burden. You're supposed to only help them carry their load. I don't know if that has any difference for you, but you really can't bear their burden. Only they can bear their burden. But if they know that they're not going through it alone, that's what I think physicians often can do with a remarkable beauty and goodness, is if sort of like you're on the side of something and you say, we're going to, I'm going to give you some advice of how to get from here to there. And I'm going to walk with you through this. And I'm going to be there. And I'm not going to abandon you if my therapies don't work. Because patient abandonment is a big one when you get into this attitude of I'm going to fix my patient's problem. But then when you don't fix it, then you don't know what to do with your emotions and you abandon patients. So we, we need to make sure patients know we're not going to abandon them. But it's basically helping them carry their load, not bearing their burden. And that means partly presence, but it also means that you, they know you're going to do that, give everything you have to help them. But burnout would be as if you think that you can actually save them or bear their burden for them. That's where I think you cross the line. So I have found in my own efforts to get close to some patients that it helps me a lot when I do it as a team, meaning that uh, in one of the places that I worked, in Washington, D.C., called Christ House. It was a shelter for homeless people that had been discharged from the hospital, but if they went back to the street, they would immediately get worse, so they stayed in this respite facility for a while. And everybody had multi-layered problems. But what I found was I would go over and talk to the patient for five or ten minutes, and they'd want to keep talking and keep talking, but I had to go on. So I would go on, and then one of the nurses would come over and spend five or ten minutes with the patient and talk to them, and then someone else would come. And by having five or six people talk to that patient, he had like many things he could talk about, but no one had to bear that burden alone. And so in some sense, it's also doing it as a team where you're sharing the burden and other people are helping carry it. Um, kind of going off that topic too, I, I see patients, you see them struggling, you have a discussion with them, you talk with them. And how often do you find yourself getting into a, a spiritual conversation? When is it appropriate? Like when, you know, how do we um, incorporate that uh, in a way that's gentle and, and in a way that, you know, really means something, gives meaning to your work too, you know, and when, especially when you don't have a lot of time too. Yeah. How do you do that well? Well, I think that the worst way to do it would be to do it haphazardly or too quickly or inappropriately. And so... Part of it is, um, see, what I have tried to um, express tonight is if you have an attitude that you're standing before someone who has this journey to walk, and um, they may not have walked it very well up to now, 
Um, and or maybe what they're going through is making it, they have a lot of hindrances to going forward. But the idea that you see them as someone who has come from God and is returning to God, you're more able to, I think, see when those things arise. Um, when someone, like the patient I told you, who basically realized that after having his suicide thwarted so many times that God must have a purpose for me. Well, I didn't have to bring that one on. That was, that was an invitation, right? Um, some of us are comfortable praying with patients when the right circumstances are, are, are there. And I think when patients want that, it can be a very positive thing because I think people really feel that that's an expression of you participating and helping them carry their load through prayer. But it also can be uh, unfortunate if you're trying to force that. So I always think it starts with an attitude that you see this person as a spiritual, physical being that has a destiny, that God loves them more than you do. And part of what your job is to help them see how much God loves them. And then think about how, how you can do that, what ways you can do that, through your actions, through your words, through prayer. There's no formula as you can, you know. Um, thank you for a provocative talk tonight. I appreciate it very much. And it, it evokes many ideas, but I'll just start with one. Um, I wonder about the idea of a health as a gift. And I wonder how you bring that up with your patients more particularly. Do you ever ask them who is the giver of that gift? And how does that go? Um, do the, are they accepting or or let's say uh, rejecting of this idea that there's, a, there's another power at work other than that interface that you have with the patient through medicine, through prescriptions, whatever it is yeah. kind of thing. Would, would you carry a comment on that? Well, I, I know one of the things that I find where that comes up is when patients give me too much credit for what happens. And um, in one sense, my, I, I've always said patients give you too much credit for when things go bad, and they give me too much blame for when things go bad. <laughs> when, things go, when things go good, they give me too much credit. When things go bad, they give me too much blame. That there is things that are happening in our health and our wellness that are way beyond what we do. And so one of the ways that I demonstrate health as a gift is when things turn out well, and they want to give me all the credit, that's an obvious point when we can talk about a greater power that actually has produced this healing. Uh, there's a, and I think that we've, we've lost that. We, we, we think that, I think we have this, again, transactional perspective about health and medicine these days, that if so-and-so comes in with this, and according to the treatment plan you give that, then this will happen. And even if it is penicillin for treating pneumonia, and 90% of the time that's true, my perspective is there's still times when it's not true. And so when it is true, we got to give glory to God because healing is God's work. And uh, I, I'm getting like almost too uh, sentimental about this, but sometimes I'll cut my finger and when a leak later it's healed, I just thank God that it healed because it's like, that didn't have to heal. I mean, and, and then if you have spent time in other parts of the world or you see where people's health is so much more uh, debilitating, you can't help but be thankful for the level of health you have because you realize how risky it is. I, I made that statement in the middle of my talk, you know, please hear me how hard it is to remember that we are, in essence, fleeting, fragile, and finite creatures. And you may, this may sound strange to you. This, you probably think I'm a little bit off, but sometimes I will walk through cemeteries and look at old tombstones because it reminds me of another time when people died like at 15 years of age or 13 years of age or 10 years of age, I have this um, slide that shows a, a tombstone from when I was in New Zealand, and it shows t six children that died in a course of 11 days in one family from diphtheria in 1882. And I have that slide. We have to remind ourselves how fragile health is because that's how we recognize it as a gift. How you can help your patients see that at least one of the ways for me is constantly reminding them of who's the source of all healing. I don't know if you know this famous um, quote from um, Ambrose Paré. He was a, a surgeon in like uh, France in something like 17th, 16th century. And he came up with this concoction for war wounds 
But he has this famous thing. He said, I dressed the wound, but God healed it. And, uh, you know, anytime wounds heal, don't think it's because of your, your, you know, $150 dressing. <laughs> Dr. Kutilla, thank you so much. Uh, I love the way, as you identify these four faces, that you didn't pit them against each other, which could be tempting. Um, but you did say earlier in the, the talk that it was critical to get them properly integrated, proportioned, perhaps. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. I think we're pressing for the second story, but a lot of the first story is very important. Right. And how do you get, is that individually for each patient different? Uh, Speak a little bit more to how you properly proportion them. Right. Well, the the, the first um, perspective that I illustrated, I think the 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 thing that I wanted to maybe have you go home with is that um, you should want to be the best physician you can be. That you should be learning your craft at the highest level of excellence. But it's not so you can control outcomes or be told you're the greatest physician in the world or, you know, get all the credit. It's because you're helping vulnerable people. And so that's how you keep that perspective in balance, that we, we, we know that the patient is vulnerable, but we don't want to turn it into a project, meaning that we can fix that. And then uh, it just becomes a, a, a sort of, a, again, fulfilling this idea that medicine can bandage all of society's wounds, which you can't. So I feel like, and that's why I use Dante as my integrative figure, because he was a, um, he was, some people called him the first Renaissance man because he saw the new science coming. And don't forget that at his time, uh, and I don't s say this in, in a positive way as a person of faith, that I was happy that the church at that time was often against the progress of science, that somehow they were afraid science was going to hinder religion. He didn't have that attitude. So I don't think there should be any, uh, and I address that in, in, in the book as well, there shouldn't be, there's no reason to have a hostility between science and faith. They really belong together. In fact, faith is the ground in which science really flourishes because faith understands a world that, that is investigatable because God created a world that's investigatable and gave us curiosity to figure that out. So I feel that um, Dante represents that person who believes in the good of science understands the importance of autonomy and free choice because I think we have to respect our patients' choices. I think the idea that we can paternalistically tell people what to do is a big mistake. But if we stay stuck there, it won't be, it'll be insufficient, as I said, for our noble task. And that's why I invited us to the second floor where we begin to see people in a more um, sacred, holistic, holy way, and then also see ourselves as a part of, their, of, their, of the journey ourselves. I, I would say that there are a few times when I have been able to get sort of like the way you mentioned uh, the physician playing tennis with you. You had that relationship. There, there was a time when I worked in a place where I went to church with a number of my patients. Actually, it's happened in a couple times where my patients were also went to church with me and I went on a retreat with them and they were in small groups with me and yet they were still my patients. Now, there was a little danger sometimes that they'd come up to me on Sunday and say, can you write me a prescription for that inhaler? But <laughs> You know, we, 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 could, we could deal with that, but I was able to uh, experience a, a more uh, commonality with them at that time. And so I think there's times when that should happen because I think that patients can help you become a better person. Uh, some people have said that do we look at patients as donum or datum? This is a Latin terminology. Are they data points or are they gifts? I would argue that some of our patients, as much as they sometimes don't seem that way, can actually be gifts to us if we let them tell us about their lives and learn from them. I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but... Thank you very much for the time you've put into this this evening. I had a question in regards to when you were discussing the importance of helping others to carry their load. Um, my question is, 
What have you seen in the examples, in the experiences of your career that have been useful to effectively offer that compassionate, competent care and yet maintain those healthy boundaries so that you don't end up with the burnout or with um, putting yourself in a position where uh, you're manipulated, et cetera? Right. So I... I brought up Nietzsche in our conversation tonight um, because uh, if we could spend a lot of time with his perspective on compassion. But I did try to hint at the fact that he came to the conclusion that um, compassion had no place or purpose because it either A, burned out the person who was exercising that compassion, or it belittled the person that was the compassion was being given to. And uh, I think that part of it is a, is, a, is a false definition of what we understand to be compassion. So if I'm going to use a word like empathy or compassion, what I'd like to use it for is not the one where I don't think it's empathic or compassionate to say, treat your family members. Like I love my family members more than I can, you know, love my patients from the perspective of their closeness to me. So shouldn't I then be a better physician for them? No, actually maybe not, because that's where the boundaries lost. That's where your ability to make objective decisions is hindered by your feelings for the person. So then what is real empathy then? Empathy is something that instead of it being just a feeling, it's more where your entire self is focused, your heart, your mind, your, on, on the best for that person. That actually empathy in that way is a very positive attitude because it means that you are so much wanting, you so much care, the way that physician was kneeling and looking at that person. Um, I felt empathy when I sat next to that man from Harlem that night when I was in medical school and looked at him and wanted to learn not to fix his problems or to be his savior, but just, I had empathy for him because I wanted the best for him and I wanted, if there's anything I could do to help him, I wanted to be able to do that. And that's a focusing. And I think that somehow that kind of attitude has the ability to make you sharper, like more intense in your focus of heart, mind, and body to help someone than actually hindering you. It's a, thin, it's, it's a fine line, right? You have to walk a road, and you have to constantly be vigilant. That's why I think physicians need to be contemplative about their feelings, understand when they're crossing lines. But I think that true empathy actually makes us better physicians because we become more focused and more interested in the well-being of the patient, and, but also knowing that we're not their savior. I think that's where we fall into problems when we think that we're their savior. As I say, there is a God, and I ain't it. And you know, the sooner we learn that, the better. Very quickly, you are so right to communicate with the senses. It doesn't take any time at all to look eye to eye. And that you, every time a doctor can do that, and we all can do that. The senses are so important. Let me tell you quickly this one thing. They did this study, uh, and they did a study where they had um, a physician going into a hospital room, standing at the end of the bed, talking to the patient and leaving, and the other physician, that's one group, the other physician would go in, sit at the bed, touch the patient, talk to the patient, and leave. Both patients were given the same amount of time. So it was like, it was two minutes. It wasn't a long thing. I don't know if it was one minute or two minutes. One sat at the end of the bed and talked to the patient for two minutes and left. One sat, at the, sat on the bed, touched the patient for two minutes and left. Guess which patients thought they spent more time with the doctor? The one that sat and touched the patient. It didn't take any more time. It just took another sense, the touching and, the, and getting close and looking at the patient. As I say, that's not rocket science, right? <laughs> uh, what, what your presentation is only centered upon, from what I'm interpreting, is very much the central tenets of Christianity. So I guess my question is, to what extent does, does your view necessitate a belief in Christ? And then if not, how do one apply these ideas? Well, I would say 
that being a very good question, that all of us desire to be good at what we do. And so whether it's physician or nurse practitioner, I don't know exactly all the health professions that are involved here. We all want to do good at what we do. I'm arguing that the only way you can do good at what you do is to enter into this kind of, to, to have this attitude towards your patient. Now, my belief is that you don't have to come at it from a Christian perspective initially to want this. But in my own personal experience, and again, I can only say to my own personal experience, unless you ultimately realize that you're not on your own doing this, but that you have a helper, that Christ can actually help you as the great physician to do this, that often you can't sustain it. And so for me, sometimes it's like, this might be the invitation to get into a deeper relationship in your faith by wanting to be this kind of a physician. And as you ethically try to be the best physician you can, realize you fall short and need help, and God actually is there to help you. And it often is a way to incorporate your faith to make you a better physician. And I don't mean, again, a transactional relationship with God, you know, make me a better physician, but that you know you need help, and God can help you to be a, to be a better physician, to actually increase your love and care for the patient. Well, I think... Um... At this point in time, we'll conclude the question and answer, but if there are additional questions that people have, Dr. Cutillo may be able to answer them uh, as people depart. But I'd like to just thank you uh, again for coming here and, and sharing this wonderful talk with us uh, and participating in the Veritas Forum. Thank you, Dr. Cutillo. Thank you.